Once you have enough cards, what we're going to do is, um, once kids done talking with the presentation, we're going to take some questions afterwards and also have an open coaching session. If anybody has questions, we'll have Eric from Drive Show up here at the front and Patrick from Culture by Design. So we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Kim right now. And, um, all yours, sir. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, when it comes to marketing, a lot of people don't understand the connection to marketing and data and marketing and finances. So today my aim is to hopefully bridge some of that gap uh, and bring more data into your business, into your marketing, and into your mission. A little bit about me, I started preparing marketing about three years ago. I've been doing marketing as a career for about eight. Uh, I am a huge Ohio State Buckeyes fan, and I am a little bit overly enthusiastic about numbers. We'll start here. Why should we use data driven marketing principles? Outside of the fact that virtually every Fortune 1000 company does this as a regular business practice, I believe that there's some additional concepts that would really help us. First and foremost, I think it's a rational approach to your business. Here, here's what I mean there's a guy who said this once Which of you desiring to build a house does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, he would lay the foundation and not be able to finish it and all who would see it would mock him, saying, this man has begun to build, but not able to finish it. All right? we, we take an accounting of the money we have before we enter into a project, and, and sometimes I think what happens is in marketing, we say, well, this is just creative work, and if it's creative, something will come out of it, rather than actually saying, what is the financial value of the marketing that we're looking to do, and what are we financially looking to pull out of it, and what metrics and keys do we need to hit in order for this to be successful. Additionally, data-driven marketing will really revolutionize the way your company works. Hero Gaming uh, is, a, is one of the largest casino companies in this country. They started data-driven marketing in the early 2000s or so, and they started it in a small process rolling this out across all of their locations. And what they saw was massive value add because rather than having each location be a silo unto itself with its own customer data, they were able to, to do two things which are, I think, of great value. One, they were better able to target their customers because their customers would not simply go to one location. Most of us interact with customers <laughs> in more than one facet whether that's through live networking, through the internet, phone calls, events. We interact with our customers in more than one way, if they come into our shop or we go out to meet them, etc. So there, there's a lot of ways that we interact with people. We don't necessarily know which of these is profitable and which of these isn't. But you guys have heard the old saying, half of my marketing dollars are wasted, I just don't know which half. Today with data-driven marketing, we can determine which half is actually wasted and which half is actually valuable. Jason Kepler, who uh, has written a fair amount on this subject and is really a, a guy who has done more writing on data-driven marketing in the past five years than virtually anyone else, has said this. When we combine intuition with data-driven marketing, it has the power to embolden companies to develop game-changing products and to launch campaigns that drive consumers to purchase. Here's why. If you understand the data behind the products that you sell, you can make better products. If you don't know how much someone is going to pay for a product, you don't know how much you should invest in developing it. On the flip side, if you don't know how much a customer is worth to you, you have no idea how much you should invest in getting that customer. And those are all things that we're going to talk about today. Starting with, with the first thing, this is actually a series of questions for you to think about in your own business. Are you tracking your customers right now? And when I say are you tracking your customers, I don't simply mean do you know how many customers you have, although that would be a very useful statistic, and if you don't, you should. But I mean, are you tracking how they interact with you? How often do they purchase with you? How often do they repeat business with you? What's their sign-up rate for the second year of service? Do they leave after five years on average? Do they leave after 10? Do you know? If you don't know, how can you say, this customer is a good customer for me, this is a bad customer for me? If you don't know that about your current customer base, how can you go out into the marketplace and say, I want more customers, without knowing who that customer is? By being able to identify who are your valuable current customers, you can 
seek out those which will be like those current valuable customers. Has anyone ever had this experience where you go and you get a new customer and you're really excited and then you realize that this is not going to be a good relationship because you're going to constantly lose money on the amount of time you have to spend with them? <laughs> right? You guys know what I'm talking about. If you have data up front, you can help mitigate that because you can say, you know, I find, as an example, uh, people who, who are in industry X tend to not be as good for me. They tend to leave faster, they tend to demand more of my time, or maybe it's not uh, in industry, maybe it's the amount of money they're spending with you. Maybe it's that guy who has only spent $15 with you and he's calling customer service every week about this $15 product you bought. And by this point, you're so far in the red in spending time with him and people like him that it's hard to dig out of that hole. Additionally, where are your customers coming from? Most of us acquire customers from more than one channel. Right? We use Chamber of Commerce events. We, we go to other networking events. We use the internet. We use maybe the phone book. Hopefully that's going away soon. We use, we use all of these channels to acquire customers into our business. But many of us don't know which of those avenues for acquiring customers is actually valuable. Where does your most profitable customer come into your business? So for example, I'll give, I'll give just a quick example from our business. I know for, for a fact that our morning networking groups and the amount of money that we spend in that is a far better investment for us than going to evening networking events that are maybe monthly or quarterly where, where we don't see the same people all the time. We see the same people over and over and over. It's typically a much better investment for us versus going to a place where the people who are there are going to be random each month. And so, so for us, we can say, okay, it's more valuable to target this kind of uh, time spent and money spent versus this kind. And we can make a decision based on the facts for how we are acquiring customers. Finally, what marketing investments are actually making financial sense? There are a lot of avenues to invest in marketing, a lot. There's a lot of different programs, a lot of different systems. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. And then within that good batch, assuming that, that you actually get into that batch, there are good batches that, that work for you, and there are good batches that don't work for you. So for example, billboard advertising works. It's worked for more than 100 years. But let's say that you uh, have a business that's a walk-in business that's in a really bad location. I, I have a, a client, they are a restaurant and they are no joke in the worst location in the world. Right? Parking is, is hard, Google Maps won't get you to their door. It's just impossible to find. And they actually have taken steps to put signs out on the highway to direct you to where you have to park to walk in. I mean, it is a nightmare to get there. For them putting up a billboard and saying, come to our restaurant, it's not gonna help because people aren't gonna be able to find it because it's in such a bad location. Whereas maybe internet-driven marketing where you, they can have a better picture of where they are might work a little bit more effectively, or catering, where they're going out to their customers, uh, might work even better. So, so it mitigates some of these, these issues. So what kind of these uh, investments are actually making sense for your company? These are things that uh, data-driven marketing can actually tell you. In my experience doing this with small businesses for just about a decade, the thing that I find, however, is that most, and when I say most, I mean upwards of 90% of business owners, do not make a decision based on the facts, they make a decision based on their gut feeling. They say, you know what, I think this is working. Well, why do you think that? Well, I feel like the phone is ringing more. How do you know that it's from this? How do you know that it's not something else that you're doing? If you're doing three marketing strategies at the same time, which most of us are doing, at least that, how do you know which one is actually working if you're not tracking the source? And so, Getting away from this gut feeling of what's working to facts about what's actually working is really the point of data-driven marketing. <clears throat> so we're gonna cover three key metrics and one key process today. The first, it, we're gonna start with discussing leads and advertising tracking. We're gonna follow up then with uh, a discussion of take rate, followed by churn rate, and finally by what I believe to be the most valuable today, uh, which is
customer lifetime value. Oddly enough, these are, are structured in such a way that you can't get to the next one down unless you have the previous one calculated. Uh, so it's an important uh, distinction. So let's talk about leads tracking. I'm not going to revisit this entire concept of funneling your, your leads because more books have been printed on this subject and more speeches have been given on this subject. And if you're interested, you can go listen to one of them. Uh, but I will say this. We need to, from a data-driven perspective, not simply have this idea of saying, I have leads, and we have this many leads into our business, but rather we need categorization and segmentation of our leads. What are our total leads? This is everyone who's given us a call. Beneath that, what are our qualified leads? Who are the, the people that we could actually do business with? I'll give you a quick example. Let's say that you're a photographer and you work in the Portland area and you get a call for Houston, Texas. And they say, hey, we really want you to come do this wedding shoot in Houston and we'll pay you your normal fee. You're gonna say, that doesn't really work for me. I'm not flying down to Houston and spending as much as I may. Right, so it's really not a qualified lead. From those qualified leads, you're gonna get a group of people that you actually get a proposal out for. Uh, you have a process by which they move to that next step closer to the sale. For us, it's a proposal for you to maybe uh, sit down for coffee uh, or something similar to that, depending on what your business looks like. Uh, if you're an e-commerce retailer, this is simply them adding it to the cart. Okay, so there's, there's levels here and each business is somewhat distinct. Finally, we have our close sale. These are people who've actually become our customers, right? And, and this is a much smaller group than where we start, but we need to be able to track, okay? How did these people get here? How did they weave their way through this? We, when we think about the internet, it's really easy to say, okay, they came in through the homepage, they went to these four pages, they went to the cart, and then they finally checked out. Right? We can see the flow that happens. However, the question is, from a non-internet, non-trackable, human-to-human -human relationship, how does that same thing flow? The data-driven marketing, <coughs> effective leads tracking that looks at things like source, number of meetings, etc. We can actually track this data very easily. Referral source. This is going back to this idea of which marketing investments are actually bringing in leads. If you're using, let's say, three channels and you're taking a multi-channel marketing approach, AKA I advertise in the newspaper, I do live events, and I've got a website, okay? Which one of those three is actually bringing in leads? Do we know? Do we have a system in place where we either ask or can see through some automated process where they came from? Right? That's, that's step one, and it's, it's literally as basic for most businesses is asking. If you run any kind of a service company, right, from uh, pest control to plumbing to uh, attorneys to CPAs, that whole gamut, anybody who's providing a service, it's literally as simple as asking. How did you hear about me? Where did you find us? It's just that simple. And, and you can see that, okay? And then also then tracking uh, referral source by sales. So if we go back and we think about this closed sales, right? We want to think about when I look at my volume of sales, where did they come from? Who actually brought in sales to me? Okay. So let's say that, that you have two equal buckets of leads. We'll say the internet and we'll say the yellow pages for ease. Okay. And, and what you find is they both bring in 50 leads a month and you only get 10 sales months. You, you get 10% of your leads turning into, turn into sales. Which group is actually driving those sales? It could rationally be 100% yellow pages. It could be 0% yellow pages. Unless you know, you don't know which one's actually a quality investment. And so tracking not just where do we get our leads, but where do we get our sales from, what is the source of our sales, is the foundation to this. If you don't know where sales are coming from, you're not really tracking your customers. And that's what we want to remedy. The takeaway here, data-driven marketing starts with data. It starts with data collection. Everything that we're gonna talk about today, uh, we are going to be providing free Excel spreadsheets, some of which are printable, some of which are simply digitally used. Uh, 
that will calculate every metric for you that we're discussing. Obviously, with leads tracking, there's a certain amount of personal work that has to go into this. Uh, but the aim here is we want to not just talk about this for you, we want to actually give you the tools to do this. And so we will be providing you with that. The thing to keep in mind when we're talking about leads and referral source marketing is that it's all about quality. Okay? It's not about, hey, we've got 75% in there. Great. I don't care if you have 100% in there. If it's not accurate, it's not useful. You need to be as accurate as possible. If you're only getting able to get 50% of your data in, that's fine as long as it's 100% accurate. I've worked with many companies who say, look, we're getting 80% of our data in. We're only 50% confident that it's accurate. This is, this is a discipline issue and it's a tools issue. So making sure that the data that we're working with, that we're starting with, is accurate to begin with. Take rate. Take rate is perhaps the simplest marketing metric to identify and to calculate. It's simply this, the number of accepted offers divided by your number of contacts. Why does it matter? I will give you a quick chart as to why it matters. So in each of these examples, we are looking at 500 contacts being made. Imagine that this is direct mail and you've sent out 500 postcards, okay? And let's pretend that all five, uh, four of these postcards are all different, okay? They have different offers, they have different graphics, they look different, they maybe different sizes, etc. Right? Okay? And as a result of that, the number of people accepting them varies, okay? So we've got 500 contacts here and 25 people have accepted it. We've got 500 contacts here and 35, and, and so on and so forth. That is represented here by our take rate percentages. If the value of the sale remains static, you can see the value of the marketing change. What this means is, simply put, better marketing works better. And if you know what marketing works well, if you know at what rate your customers are going to accept your offers, you can make financial and marketing decisions based upon what your firm can handle and based upon <clears throat> what kind of income you can reasonably bring in. I'll give you a quick example. We run a small company, there's only four of us. If I had 50 people come to me next month and say, hey Ken, we need a website built, we need marketing done, etc. We'd have to turn away a percentage of them because we just couldn't handle the work, right? This is, this is akin to the number of contacts that you're making. So, if, if, for example, what I needed to do is I needed to get 25 new clients in the door, okay? If I know that my take rate is 10% versus 5%, I can reasonably subtract uh, from my number of contacts and get 250 contacts, saving a fair amount of money, but getting the same number of clients in the door by having a better take rate. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. Right? It's, it's simple math, but what, what it's really telling us is how many offers are we putting out there and how many offers are being accepted and what decisions do we need to make based upon that. If you know the take rate of your marketing, you are going to realistically be able to figure out your acquisition cost, which is the sister to uh, take rate from a financial side. Acquisition <coughs> cost is pretty simple. How much money do you have to spend to get a new client, a new sale? That was difficult. However, the, the uh, equation is somewhat more complicated, but if we really break it down, we're ultimately looking at our cost to contact one person divided by our take rate is our acquisition cost. So what? If you can reduce your cost per contact and you keep your and you can increase your take rate, you're, what you're going to see is an exponential growth in your business and an exponential savings. It's it's pretty basic math, but if if we take this and let's say that this is two and this is two, right? I move my take rate. Uh, to four, and I move my cost to one, right? Now instead of having, having that equal one, it's gonna equal four. So it's got an exponential 
value to this. Understanding this is really important though. If you have no idea the rate at which people are going to accept your marketing, you have no idea the rate at which you, at which you need to advertise, at which you need to be working to bring customers in. Akin to that, if you don't know the rate that they're going to accept your marketing, you have no way to predict uh, the cost of that marketing. And so, so that's kind of a, a base level for uh, for this marketing metric for take rate. Ultimately, take rate is a cost control built into your model marketing. It offers you the ability to drive your marketing costs down. If you know what it is and you know uh, that you can take steps to improve it, you can drive those costs down at the end of the day. And that's why take rate is so important. It's not closely guessing. Churn rate. Churn rate equally uh, is an important met metric to understand. It is the percentage rate at which customers stop subscribing to your service. How many of us care about the rate at which people stop subscribing to our service? Right? Because that means money going away from us. There are three primary time frames for which we calculate churn rate. 30 days, 90 days, and one year. Uh, if you're a bigger company, that may go even longer, uh, especially if you have uh, an incremental service. A couple of examples of that might be painting or auto sales. Uh, but for our purposes today, we're just setting those off to the side, simply because the concept is the same and the time range are just going to Why does churn matter? Churn is ultimately, again, the, the rate at which people are leaving your business. And what that results in is things like lost revenue. Who likes that? Nope. Bad press. We don't like angry customers. Lost market share. This becomes really important if you're a little bit bigger business. Let's say that you are a top person in your industry or in your area. You're the number one mechanic in Tiger. Okay? Customers start not coming back to you. They're churning through because they're not happy with the customer service they're getting. And instead, they're going to your competitor. You lose that market share, you lose that word of mouth, and, and now your competitor is the number one business, and that is not a good place to be in. Uh, but also, churn matters because of the cost to acquire a new customer. We've all heard the saying, it's cheaper to uh, sell the customer you have than to get a new customer, right? Heck of a lot easier, too. And so if we can look at and identify our churn rates, not that we can ever get them necessarily to zero, but we can look at some, some things to uh, reduce that and to help mitigate uh, the reasons that people are trading. Again, uh, we have a spreadsheet that we'll be giving to you that uh, Ted and Eric will be sending out uh, either tomorrow or Monday that will actually have uh, a calculator built in for you guys to be able to calculate this for your business. Ultimately though, uh, churn matters because sometimes you can't recover from a loss. And there are times in business and in life where when you lose, that's it, the game is over, okay? If you have a churn rate of 50%, and you know that every one of your customers in, let's say, two years is gone, right? The idea of having to market to fill that gap, it's just not possible, because you've got this ever-increasing marketing spend as they're churning through your company. I, I've seen uh, companies here in this very area who had churn rates as high as 95% over one year. What that means is that for every customer you get within a year, 95 of them are gone. That means you've got to have a massive capital expense on the front end. Okay, on, uh, vice versa, let's say that we've got a 5% churn rate and our customers only leave us uh, five for every hundred that we get over the course of a year. That means that, that we can build this sustainable base of recurring income. And I'll give you a quick uh, bit of numbers here. And I didn't, I didn't put it on the screen because I didn't want to bore you. If your business brings in $2,000 a month of new recurring revenue, you make somewhere around $15,000 a month now. If you do that month over month and you have a 10% churn rate within the next four years, you will be a $4.5 million company. 10% churn rate. If, however, you have a 30% churn rate and you bring in the same amount of money and you have the same starting point, you will be a $400,000 a year company. That difference is massive. 
who would rather make four and a half million versus four hundred thousand? Right? All of us. And so the rate at which we can keep customers in our business is super critical. By the way, you can all laugh at this now. <laughs> I, I was laughing when I was putting it together. <clears throat> yes. Marketing to those who churn. Okay. The reality is there's going to be a percentage of people <laughs> who churn out of your business. They're going to leave. And, and yet there is a, uh, gosh, that's really funny. I didn't think I was going to laugh. Let's check one. There's going to be a percentage that leave. And yet what we can do is we can uh, market directly to those if we can track who's going to leave, right? That's all about leads and sales, right? That first step. But then also we can calculate the percentage of what they're going to do it. Okay? I'll give a quick example. We all have those VIP customers, that top 10, 20%, right? If you know that they churn at a 5% rate, and you know that if you can spend X number of dollars to reduce that to 3%, there's a heck of a lot of value there. And this is where loyalty marketing comes in. It, it's that marketing that allows you to market to your current customers to help them uh, grow in your business and to regain uh, their trust before they leave uh, AKA your retention. It makes it so that you don't have to go find new customers, you can keep those customers that you have. And this is a heck of a lot easier for a couple of reasons. One, they're already in your database. You already know who they are, you already know what they're worth to you. You already know what their sales history is, you know what they like, what they don't like. Loyalty marketing, which we're not gonna spend a lot of time on today, is the solution to churn. It allows you to take practical steps to say, hey, we're gonna stop the bleeding here. Take away. Good marketing is not about the front door all the time. When it comes to churn, it's all about looking at the back door and figuring out the rate at which people are leaving the business versus the rate at which people are staying. Customer lifetime value. This is an estimate of the net profit that is attributed to the entire future relationship with the customer. Okay? This is, in my opinion, one of the most critical metrics that you can figure out for your customers. In fact, it's so important and frankly easy to calculate that I put the equation right there for you guys. Uh, no nuts, I'm pretty basically done. Uh, shouldn't be a problem, right? No, but seriously, it actually is pretty easy to calculate and, and uh, it's a critical metric again. We have a very fancy spreadsheet that we will give you that all you have to do is plug in about five numbers and you're good to go. I'm going to give a quick example of Walmart. Walmart came out uh, recently and there's been several pieces done that their average customer lifetime value over the lifetime of a customer is between $210,000 to $250,000. That means if your 10-year-old never shops at Walmart again, they are going to lose $200,000 over the course of that person's life. That is a lot of money. It's a lot. And so if you know this, you know how much you can spend to acquire a customer. I'll give you a practical example. We've got a client who has an online retailing business, and what he found was that the cost to acquire a new customer was about $2 uh, more than the expense. So for him to go acquire a new customer through a particular internet avenue was about $2 more of an expense. However, the average number of sales and lifetime value of that customer over two years was about eight to 10 times the, the cost of that marketing. So what he could tell us and what we can tell him uh, today is that if he invests, that while it's going to be cash negative year one or sale one, that when we hit sale two, sale three, sale four, sale five, it becomes valuable. I'll give you a quick example of where we actually see this playing out. Have you guys ever seen, uh, have you guys ever used Google AdWords, right? I found an interesting thing recently. Did you know that if you were to run a Google Shopping ad for staplers, the average cost per click is $15? And if you were to go and you were to look at the value of those staplers that they're selling, it's actually about $10. But why are companies doing this? 
Well, Staples knows, or Walmart knows, that if they can get you buying your office products from them, it's not about a $10 staple. Lost. It's not even necessarily a lost leader that they're discounting it. They're not. They're not really discounting it. They're just recognizing the value of you as a customer, as someone who goes to them, right, is more than this $10 staple. So they can spend more than it's worth to get that customer in, knowing that that customer is going to have future sales with them. The advantage here is this. A lot of our marketing in small business is, is really reined in to what do we see profit on day one. When I make a sale, I need to make profit day one. Tell a lot of small business owners to think. Because they're saying, if it's not, I'm, I'm losing money. Which in a way they are. But what's the value of that customer over their five-year or two-year or three-year relationship with you? Is it worth more than that first sale? I would argue yes, especially if they're a recurring customer. Uh, I'll give one, one last example. I've got a client uh, who, he has a year-long contract that he, he does with people. Uh, that year-long contract, we'll say, is valued at $1,000 uh, for ease. His average monthly sale uh, is, is about a hundred dollars, give or take, it's actually about eight. Uh, and, and the issue is, for him, he has to spend more to get that first customer in for month one than they're worth. But they've got a year-long contract they have to sign with him. Right, and so he knows, okay, month one, I've gotta lose money in order to get someone in the door. But if he doesn't know them, and, and, and he's comfortable with that because he goes, look, my solution is that they have to sign a year-long contract. But, I would argue, if, if he, he looks at that, he could say, okay, my renewal rate for these one-year contracts is 87%. That means that, that for every person that I take a loss on, even in the first year, I'm gonna make X, number of, X amount of profit, year two, year three, year four, year five, et cetera. So it allows them to really see what they should be spending to acquire a customer. A lot of times when we do forecasting as business owners, we look at sales numbers, right? Look, we had this many sales last year, this quarter, this is how many sales we can expect. I would argue that that is backwards thinking. Ultimately, sales as a metric is the rear view mirror of your car. You're sitting in your car, you're looking in the rear view mirror, that is your sales. It's already happened, it's behind you. Customer lifetime value, uh, by, by comparison, is the windshield. It's looking forward. What, what happens after that sale? How much are they worth to me over the course of their lifetime with my business? If you know this, what, what ways would you maybe change your customer service? Would you change your marketing? Would you change your interaction with them? To do a couple of things. One, to retain them longer. Two, to make them happier. Three, to help them bring in maybe referral clients, etc. Right? It allows you to look at a customer, not just for what they've already given me, but for what they will give me. And it, it actually allows for business forecasting. Who would like to know what they're gonna make next year? If you know the amount, the amount of customers that you estimate to gain, AKA your take rate based upon your acquisition cost of marketing, you can predict the amount of customers that you're gonna get. And if you know the average value for these customers, you can also predict how much you're going to make. This is this is revolutionary to small business because it's no longer I hope we make this amount of money next year. It's rather based on the data, and I understand that there's going to be a range in here, and it's not going to be 100 percent accurate. But based on our data, we see and expect a high and low between this and this, and so it allows for better business planning. Practically, using customer lifetime value allows you. <coughs> You set a reasonable application. So again, you don't have to be trapped in this bucket of what are they going to make me today? Uh, I was working, you guys remember when the Gulf oil still happened? I was working with an attorney at that time and he was doing an AdWords campaign and he said, Ken, here's $10,000 to spend this week. This week, I need, to get, I need to get as many clients signed up for a class action suit in this week as possible. Right? Here's ten thousand dollars. Go spend in capital. We spent ten thousand dollars in a week. Uh, it was funny because day one the AdWords clicks were about a dollar. By the end of the week they were about three hundred. Uh, then he ran out of money because they were three hundred dollars a click. <coughs> but it 
allowed him to set an acquisition cost because he knew that if he went into this class action lawsuit and won, which he did, he would make a lot more than $10,000. In fact, he walked away three years later with $6 million because he could estimate what was the value of his customer. How much should I spend on loyalty marketing? If you know the customer lifetime value, you know how much you should spend to retain a customer. You know how much you lose if they churn out of your business. <coughs> However, what I believe the, the key point here is you know who is your most valuable customer. Let's say that you're a business that has a thousand customers, a bigger business, okay? You, you deal with a lot of people. Not all of them are worth the same to you. And so you can use uh, customer lifetime value to look at groupings of customers. And you can figure out which groupings are actually most valuable to you and thus would, where you should spend your money. This is what larger companies do. In fact, if you look at larger banks in this country, they, based upon your CLV to them, will adjust how long you have to wait on hold to talk to a, to a teller or whether or not you have to pay a fee to a teller uh, in person. They use this metric to control their customers and thus their costs. We could take this a step further. We're not going to really talk on this today, but I just want to touch on it. That using a customer lifetime value allows you to control cost for your customer. And, and this, at the end of the day, results in being able to fire those unprofitable customers because you know what their lifetime value to you is. If you can see, look, I've got these bottom end customers and their lifetime value to me for this bottom 5% is all negative. My cost of service, my cost of marketing, my cost to acquire is always negative. You can go in and fire that bottom realm of customers and say, look, we're not dealing with these people anymore because it's not worth it. We're losing money. But if you don't know your customer lifetime value, you can't really track that very right effectively. Again, it's a grouping technique. Uh, it allows you to see the profitability uh, as a group of specific segments of customers and group them together. It gives you the ability to segment out those most valuables and it allows you to treat those VIP customers as VIPs. Uh, again, I don't, we we're running a little light, light on time, so I won't go into this uh, too much, but that is the end goal of CLB. It's not about uh, just calculating one client CLB, but it's going through your entire database of clients and saying, what is the, the realm of client lifetime value and how can I create financial controls to say, okay, people who are worth less than $1,000 to me, go here. People who are worth uh, less than $4,000, go here. And people who are worth uh, $7,000 and up, go here. Uh, I work for a nonprofit and we do this with donors. If you donate X amount of money, we know we have to do certain things. AKA, if you donate $1,000 a year, uh, we're gonna do this, right? If you donate $2,000 a year, we're gonna do this. And we actually have a structured plan based upon the amount you donate. Businesses can do this exact same thing if they know their customer lifetime value, and your larger companies, aka your Fortune 1000 companies, all do this. Takeaway, COB is the windshield of your company. It allows you to see what's coming and to make corrections and to take the right path. It'll also allow you to treat your VIPs like VIPs and thus reduce the churn of those VIPs. <coughs> I was a little bit frustrated as I was writing my concluding remarks because I got one page done and I felt like I was nowhere near complete. So I feel a little bit like a Baptist here because I've got four pages of concluding remarks. You know, you know all that past here. And in conclusion, and he keeps going for half an hour. <laughs> the other kind of metrics that provide great value, and we could spend a fair amount of time discussing that. Uh, the book that we're giving away actually discusses 15 of them, of which these are only three. Uh, we, we haven't gotten into things like net present value and rate of return, etc. Uh, but those are also critical metrics uh, to look at and calculate. Uh, the metrics that we discussed today, I believe, allow you today to do at least three things for once you get the spreadsheets. One, take rate will allow you to see the effectiveness of your current marketing. Churn rate will allow you to see the effectiveness of your customer service and or your product. And customer lifetime value will allow you to see the value of your customers going forward, forward and figure out who your most valuable customers are. And frankly, I think all of us would like to have each of those things in our hands right now. This allows us to make better decisions. Additionally, you can combine these metrics to do some really special things. 
For example, if you combine your churn and your CLV, you can examine the rate at which your most important customer leaves you. Now, we can also substitute the word important for other things, aka profitable, referring, unprofitable. Imagine if you could look, look out there and you could see your customers based on source who refer the most people in. Right? And you can see the rate at which those people churn out and thus the value of that customer. Factoring in the, the additional referrals that they give you. That now allows you to do some really special things for that kind of person. With data driven marketing, you too can be a winner. And our end focus is to give you the tools that you need <laughs> to really win in business. And that's our aim, is to have these things in your hands and to be able to look at your company and your clients through a new lens, which is not this gut feeling of, I think we're working, I think this is doing okay, but based on the numbers, this is working, this isn't working, and to make decisions based upon that information. I really appreciate you guys being here, and uh, I hope that you enjoy this book. If you don't win it, it's still definitely worthwhile picking up and reading through. Thank you. So feel free to talk about the bit, bit, drive his car, harass him throughout the week, it's good for him. Um, great, Eric up here from my company from Drive County and talk a little bit how it can tie in some of this um, specifics Kim was talking with, with QuickBooks and financial in general. So Eric, we're up here with QuickBooks. Good morning, uh, I, I'm, I'm Eric from Drive County. Uh, thank you, those are awesome information. You hit right at the core of why we do what we do. We love taking the guesswork out of your business because we all spend so much time just doing and doing and doing. And then, like you mentioned, the rear view mirror. I, three times this week already, I've asked people, hey, what do you plan on making next year? And I'm faced with blank stares. They have to, they have to guess. And so you know, there's, a, there's that old adage, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And we like taking the guesswork out of it. So, so much of these metrics, I mean, accounting isn't just your your checkbook balance and your invoices and whatnot. It extends to these other metrics and how you can now make wise decisions about your business. So um, a lot of these things can be tracked within your financial information, but there are other bolt-ons, so to speak, where you're tracking what you do. So um, Ken, I just want to say thank you. I thought that was awesome, the different things you covered. It hit right at the core of why I do what I do. So um, I guess we have a uh, time for open coaching, um, you know, questions, can be related to this, related to anything else, and about things that you're stuck on in your business. Um, and it can be across the board for whatever's uh, bugging you. We have Ken here, we have, uh, who obviously focuses on metrics, on, on the marketing aspect. I focus on accounting systems, on those same metrics, on how to get information out. And we have Patrick with Culture by Design, who Patrick is one of, any time there's a people problem or some, something with someone trying to make a choice, Patrick has been the best person I have ever run into in my life for helping people do those decisions. So if you have questions about employees or decisions or things like that, Patrick is the, the guy to go to. So, um, yeah, yeah. Shall we come up and? Yeah, why don't you guys come on up real quick so everybody goes up. Thank you, Patrick, on your way up there. I got a question for you. Okay. Kim was talking about churn out your bottom line by your say your clients. Yes. How do you gracefully do that without pissing people off? <laughs> Maybe the lack of a better word, right? How do you fire your clients how, how, how do you fire gracefully? How do you fire clients gracefully? Um, that's a great question. Fire clients gracefully. Um, you haven't had the talk with us yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, is this, uh, you know, actually, let's, let's do a role play. Fire you as a client. Fire you. Obviously, so. Um, <laughs> That's a great question. Boy, you hit me with like that. Uh, uh, yeah, wow, that was that's a softball. Yeah, that was softball. So obviously, it's hard. Um, and especially, you know, I think why it's hard for me personally is because uh, empathy is a is a is a, a uh, sometimes a skill, but sometimes a sometimes a curse. Um, but I uh, typically the way the, let me say it, let me say this the way I typically would do it is. Um, I get to the place where I just feel like, uh, yes, there's the data behind it. And Ken, you're absolutely right. Um, you, you don't want to fire your best clients. Um, when I find myself 
having to put in more time and effort and energy to serve somebody, and I know that it's not it's not profitable for me, then I have the conversation. It's, it's, it's going to sound so cliche, but it's the old "it's not you, it's me," which is really how I do it. It's the it's, but um, it's it's a, I get to a sincere place. No, I, I if this is true, I get to a sincere place where it's like, yeah, I just I just don't know that I can help you with what you need. And, and to me, I, I soften the landing by saying, let me talk about some other people that I can connect you to. So that's just something that I like to do, to your point, to, because I don't, ever, I don't ever like to say no to anybody. But I will say, I can't, but, or I, I may not be the right person for you, let me connect you to, you know, here are some other options, and if you'd like, I can make the connection. So that's perfect, that makes sense. Right. I had a step onto that. Um, um, Ted and I were talking with yesterday. We have a client that we're doing bookkeeping for at Flat Fee, and we are barely breaking even, which means we're doing all the work, all the admin, everything else um, for a small amount of money that um, we are, before expenses, just paying our bookkeepers, we're, we're breaking even. So we need to have that come to Jesus meeting with the client. And um, it can be, it, it doesn't always need to be firing. It can be restructuring the relationship. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's very kind. Yeah. Well, well, no, I, I mean, and let, let me rephrase that. I mean, it's, so in this case, we're going to talk with them about how we can do things more efficiently. Saying, you know, hey, can you get us your time cards in a more efficient manner? Can you, um, yeah. um, you know, can you organize this information as it comes to us? That way we don't need to double their rate. We need to have a slight increase, but if we do these other things, we can, we can now make this a profitable client. And so setting those expectations up front or throughout the process as these come up is important because I'm, I'm similar. Yeah. I don't like saying no to people. I don't like saying, you know, um, hey, you know, we're going to let you, um, was it succeed elsewhere? Yeah. It's, uh, we're just succeed elsewhere. Yeah. 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 It's, um, so you, just because they're an existing client, if you have that relationship with them, you can open up and you can you can talk to people about those. I think that's, a, that's, that's that preface is, to me, firing the client is a last resort. Uh, wherever you can restructure it, have that conversation about expectations, which is why I think, really, expectations are critical at the beginning of the relationship to say, here's what I can do, here's what my commitment is to you, here's what I need from you. And that's something that very often as small business owners, we, Ken, you made a great point, we make decisions because, we make short-term decisions because we need cash flow. We need, we, need, we need to be profitable today. And because of that, very often we don't put our own expectations on the client. We don't manage the client very well up front. And that's how we end up getting into those situations where soon into or down the road in, in that relationship, we find ourselves not profitable with that particular client. We got ourselves into that situation because we weren't clear with our expectations up front. So I think here's the, the key takeaway from what Eric says it's never too late to go back and reset expectations. It's never too late to reset expectations with something, just to say, hey, let's just have a check in. Here's where we are. Here's where we started looking out. You know, here's what's changed. Um, here's what I need. What do you need from me? How's this working for you? Uh, it's not that it's always about profit, but that's a big indicator. I mean, if I'm going to volunteer, I have other organizations that I'd rather, rather volunteer with, you know, that I think can help more people. So it's, um, you know, there has to be, both sides have to honor that relationship. If it's, if it's just us giving, then, it, then it's not a long-term relationship that we want to have anyway. So. <coughs> Did anybody else have any questions for these three guys up here? Related to your business, <coughs> uh, off the wall to give a hard question here or anything? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Um, on your, you did all your calculations and cost of marketing and all. How do you factor in the personal time that you're doing on your marketing? And there's two situations. One, you're marketing instead of working, <coughs> and in another situation, you've allocated X hours to the marketing, so you're not really taking away from the work time. So, so with anything, you need to assign a value to your hourly rate of which you're doing marketing, right? So if you're spending five hours a week of marketing, you need to know that our business is spending X number of dollars in marketing, even if it's not a check that's going out, uh, because it's time that's not being spent so much. You need to create and invent uh, a valuation for that time. And then when you look at cu customer lifetime value, uh, part of that equation is cost to serve your client, uh, as well as cost of goods. And so we get rolled into that. Um, 
you can also factor that into acquisition cost, uh, which is you know kind of your starting point. Uh, um, there's a time value of money, and that goes into our acquisition cost. So uh, I'll give a quick example of a direct mail piece. Uh, it may only cost you uh, $500 for the printing, for the stamps, for the labels, all of that stuff. But if you spend an extra four hours working with the designers or designing it yourself, you need to put an extra $200, $300 into that total cost that gets spread across each client. And so it's, it's just a matter of factoring it in to the equation either in post-sale customer service time or into acquisition cost. And there's a point to that because the is assigning the value to your time can be difficult because uh, it's not necessarily your bill rate unless you're turning away clients, you know? So um, you have to, there, it's a little bit arbitrary, but the way I look at it is the difference between working in your business and working on your business. So when you are, when you're the sole operator, and so still in our company, I do a lot of the bill board. And um, we've been trying to get um, me out slowly over the years to, to where I'm doing more management of the company. And there is, um, there's a cost associated with that, but if the business is dependent upon me and Ted, then it's not really a business. It's just, you know, we have jobs as a you know, sole practitioner, we're working in this here. So what would it cost? Sure, I'm doing the work because I don't want to pay someone else to do it, or they can't, or whatever the case, but what would I pay someone else that was able to do that work? So that's the number I typically use, is that if I could get someone else to, you know, you know to do this marketing, what would it cost? And that's how I assign the value to that. Uh, that also comes up quite often when we're looking at uh, margins, as far as your cost of goods sold that Kim was talking about. How profitable each of these projects are going forward. If you're doing a lot of that work in your business, you need to be able to assign that time to it. So again, in our business, um, you know, when I'm doing that work, I assign a cost to that of what it would cost me to have someone else do that work. So it's a bit arbitrary, you gotta play with the numbers a little bit to make certain it makes sense. The most important thing with any of these metrics, even if they're wrong, is to stay consistent. Because when they're consistent, now you can compare things. Cover kind of good? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Back to the question. Yeah, hey, question for both the guys on my right. Uh, in terms of, so so much of, of our marketing, uh, well, let me say this, it's easy to think of marketing in terms of dollars that we're spending in not running ads or um, um, have, have a presence here. Many of us as small business owners market through building relationships through one-to-one -one cups of coffee or sitting down with somebody for a half hour or an hour here. Um, is there, uh, Ken, to you, half the question is, is there benefit to tracking that as marketing? And then, Eric, is there a recommended methodology for how to do that from an accounting perspective? <clears throat> yes and no. Okay. The, the benefit is, is when you're tracking those things, you, the, the bare minimum obviously is, is source, right? You are the source. Mm -hmm. When we look at how do we actually put a financial label on that, again, it goes back to what's an hour of your time worth. Right. Um, for us, I think about, okay, if I could be putting, what would I be paying a salesman per hour to do this, right. or on a commission to do this? That's some of how I think of that. Um, and how, you know, what's the difference, what am I saving, maybe is a way to think of it. Although, I'll be honest, in our business, sales is is separated from that, because relationship building and referral seeking is its own beast in and of itself, and there's, it's very difficult to tie any kind of financial number to that. Uh, especially because you can do a lot of that work with nothing, and you can do very little of that work with so that's why some of the networking stuff, I think it's more effective to track by source. That's okay. This is relationship building in general. All of that's gonna go in the same pot and we see that this pot brings in this amount of money. Versus saying, uh, these people bring in this amount of money. Now where that could become valuable is, let's say you work with CPAs, uh, attorneys, and bookkeepers, mm -hmm. right? Like estate planning attorneys. <clears throat> and you know that in each of these buckets, there's gonna be a value of referral to you, let's say you're a payroll company, right? You could look at it and say, okay, well my CPAs are worth this to me, the attorneys are worth this to me, and, and the bookkeepers are worth this to me. But again, that's still ultimately tracking by source, not by time span. Okay. 
that makes sense. And we track that. Um, and so when we do QuickBooks and you're doing invoices through there and whatnot, we assign a, a field to that for the source of revenue, whether it came from the chamber, whether it came from a BNI group we were part of. Um, so for Patrick and I are in a BNI group together, we actually so I, I track not only did the money go to BNI, but which member it came from from BNI. So now I can see. Um, you know where I'm getting most of my referrals. I know who say thank you for close business and you know etc. But I'm able. I remember uh, about 12 years ago, I was sitting with a woman who did a lot of yellow pages, a lot of uh, radio, TV, internet advertising, and different different things. And she felt that most of her business probably came from some of her TV appearances. And um, I, I knew intuitively it wasn't. It was from the referrals and whatnot. And that's what her numbers showed once we tied this information to that. So often, you, know, you were talking about, this feels like it's, it's right, but our guts lie to us all the time. We, we think that it's correct, but that's where you go, to go back to these metrics. So we, we track where this business comes from, but like uh, Ken said, it's difficult unless you're putting a time to that. Um, or So in, in our company, Ted, Tim and I, build a lot of these relationships. Um, I still, um, I got a call um, earlier this month from a guy I haven't talked to in five years. He was a client in 2006 and I haven't talked to him in, in five years and um, just referred me a great client that is that called me yesterday and we're gonna get going with. So there's, that's the difficult part of quantifying is how good you are at that and the, the relationships you build is they, in theory, if you're honoring those relationships, they should be paying off for years. So it's it's difficult. So what we do is that we say, you know, we want to assign X amount of time to this, and we want to build these relationships, because we know we track those metrics. This is where most of our business comes from. Now you use that slicing of data, like Ken was talking about, to say, okay, now where should I spend that time? But um, if you're responsible for bringing in a new business, that's just something that you've got to do. It's, uh, and it's a balance between how much time you have available and working in your business right, as well. So. All right, thanks guys. So we're about to wrap up the program now because we're gonna kick us out of here. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna head down to the valuation forms right now. We appreciate it, everybody was truly honest on this as if it was your little brother giving a presentation. Big brother? Big brother, little brother, whoever you're not particularly fond of. That would be what we can approve on here. And, Please. <laughs> all, all five doesn't do anybody any good if there's no data behind that that we're talking about. As we build out those, I'm going to go ahead and have a bucket to pass it up. Here's a business card, if you don't mind. We're going to wrap off of the book here. And a $25 gift card. Around a little. Yeah, I might. Actually, it's a 